you can, there's ways you'll be able to do that um, through the legislative process. So you can always critique the policy, et cetera, if you have alternative views on it or et cetera. Um, if you don't have a chance tonight to express that. Um, so that being said, I'm just double checking one more thing before I, okay. So there's, I'm hoping somebody can get in still, but we're gonna start, the boat is leaving the dock. Um, so, um, so welcome to our webinar tonight uh, about decriminalization of plant fungal medicine. Uh, the reason that um, we're here is because of a bill that's being introduced in Vermont um, that we're gonna start out by talking, we're gonna talk about that to start, but really we're here to talk about the issue in general. So um, I introduced this bill. Oh, great. Now, now, we're, now the person got in that I was waiting for, so I feel like I can relax. So, um, so why did I, why am I introducing this bill? Um, because I believe that humans have this like sacred birthright to have access to plant and fungal medicine and that uh, the government shouldn't get in the way of that, and, but has. And we live in a colonial society that has turned everything in the world into a commodity. Uh, and we need to kind of undo that. And so that's why I introduced the bill. And I have my own personal experiences where these medicines have helped me heal from trauma and help help me overcome problems and help me like realize my power as a human. Um, and so when I was thinking in the last session about, you know, what is some of the work that still needs to be done, I thought I thought, well, let's in general, we should decriminalize and defelonize all drugs. But specifically plant medicines, um, it should that should happen ASAP. And this bill fits into a wide range of po policy suggestions happening in Vermont around decriminalization and defelonization. This is one of many bills that are coming out um, along these lines. But this one, we focus on plant and fungal medicine because once again, the idea is to get the government out from in between people and, and nature. So that's the reason why it's pretty simple. I'm gonna show you the bill. Um, just wanted to make sure it was ready to go. So here it is. I'm always worried like what's gonna pop up when you do this. All right, so, so here's the bill. Um, so, and I'll explain what it does. Um, so what it does is the, it proposes to decriminalize some chemical compounds found in plants that are commonly used for medicinal, spiritual, religious, or entheogenic purposes. And it's called an act relating to decriminalize certain chemical compounds found in plants that are commonly used for medicinal, spiritual, religious, or entheogenic purposes. So in Vermont law currently, this is how it's written, okay? This is what's in current law. And what we do is right now in the section that defines a hallucinogenic drug, it, ha it includes peyote and psilocybin and all these other drugs that you see, what we do is we strike those out. We basically say they're not counted. And this is a technical correction. Then over here, it skips to a different section of the law where it defines what regulated drugs are. And what this bill does is it, it they made this little tech cleanup here with the number system. But what it does is it clearly says that these drugs are not, these things, these beings, whatever, however you want to define them, that they are not regulated drugs. These are no longer regulated drugs. So I highlighted what those things are. Peyote, ayahuasca, cacti containing mescaline, psilocybin or psilocin, ibogaine, and, and dimethyltryptamine, or any plants containing those substances. So what this bill is essentially doing is it's just freeing these plants and fungi, fungi from being regulated, from being considered a regulated drug. And I had a friend the other day who said, well, she was asking me a lot of questions about what does this, um, okay, there was a little technical glitch here. She, she's asking me questions about, you know, what does this mean? And the, way, the best way I could explain it is we're just treating them like other plants and fungi. We're just saying they're plants and fungi, they're not drugs. 
That's what it does. Very simple idea. I know other people have other conceptions about how we should do this. And like I said, this is one way we're trying to do it is part of a multi-pronged strategy where we're trying to defelonize all drugs and decriminalize many, um, many human behaviors in general. We're also looking at decriminalizing um, sex work because we, there's too many crimes on human, too often we judge people, we stigmatize human behavior. And what we're trying to do here is move away from that. So um, that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to, the, to our friends from Decriminalized Nature to speak next about um, their work and its connection to this bill. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you very much Assembly Member Sina. It's uh, really amazing to see uh, you put this together and uh, we need more courageous leaders out there in uh, the House and the Senate to, to make things happen on the state level. Uh, I think what I uh, really enjoyed about reading over this is the simplicity of it. You know, um, if you really wanted to kind of make it more difficult, you'd have to go in and take out, because a big part of nature is being able to grow your own, being able to gather your own. Be able to share in the ceremony, those type of types of things, but those are all housed under different definitions. So you'd have to kind of go through and unpack all that. But by just turning these into unregulated drugs or quote unquote, whatever that means in nature, right? Uh, it really kind of pulls you out of that. I think that's it was a really brilliant way to do that. And I know a lot of other cities and, and states are looking at this as a, a potential model for how to kind of move things forward in, in their city or state. Um, my name is Larry Norris. Hello, everyone. Um, Co founder of Decrim Nature. Uh, also uh, work with a nonprofit called Erie. It helps with uh, doing integration and support systems. Um, and we've been helping with this uh, national sort of movement that's been going on across the US. Um, we've passed so far in um, Oakland, California in June of 2019, uh, Santa Cruz in January 2020, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, a couple of Ann Arbor folks are here today uh, in September 21st, 2020. And then um, Washington DC passed in November of 2020. And then most recently, Somerville and Cambridge, Massachusetts passed in January, February of 2021. Uh, since 2021 has begun, this has really picked up a lot of momentum going on across the US right now. So it's really exciting to see some state level legislation happening uh, as uh, Assemblymember Cena has put forward. So uh, really excited to see everyone here. If you have any questions on anything, I can offer an educational material. I did put my email up into the email box there. So if you have any uh, more concerns or thoughts or anything, I can help you from uh, research side. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Carlos now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Carlos Plazola and also grateful uh, Representative Cena, um, just really leading with courage and by example, um, and hopefully many other uh, state reps across the uh, U.S. will do likewise. Um, we have our, our own representative here in California that will also be uh, coming out with some hopefully very wonderful legislation here in the next few days along the same lines. But you know, the way we framed it very early on in, in um, to the Oakland City Council in June of 2019 was imagine that you have a, a tomato garden or an orange tree. Um, all this is saying is that your ability to grow your own tomatoes and grow your own oranges uh, should not be a criminal activity. You should be able to grow them. You should be able to harvest them. You should be able to share them, make uh, your medicine or your meal with your uh, tomatoes or oranges. Um, and, uh, but if you then choose to um, uh, manufacture something from those tomatoes or sell them at a farmer's market, then you, then at that moment, you step into a regulatory framework. But if it's only for personal use, then there's no reason they should be criminalized. And so um, what this does is really takes away all the, um, the, the need for regulations on our plant allies. Um, and for those of you who had the opportunity to build a connection with, with um, these uh, sacred plants, uh, you'll, you'll understand that there's really great benefit and, and value that comes from them. So really grateful for, for the work here and for everybody turning out and hopefully giving support to this um, effort. Thank you, Carlos. So um, before I call up our next guest, I'm just gonna respond to a question I saw in the chat. I said I wasn't gonna do that, but. I think it's relevant because I mentioned the bill, but I didn't, people are asked um, if it had been introduced yet. This bill hasn't been introduced yet. And at the end of this meeting, um, we are gonna provide you with some suggestions about advocating for it. We're trying to get co-sponsors to sign on by Friday and I will introduce it on Friday. So if you're a Vermonter and you're on the, the Zoom tonight, reaching out to your representative in the next 24 hours and saying, asking them to sign on this bill to support it, if they get in touch with me by Friday, they can 
be a co-sponsor. And so the next step is going to be getting co-sponsors and then introducing it by next week. And then we'll turn our attention to advocating to the committee it goes to and asking them to consider testimony. We know that during the pandemic, there's going to be a finite number of bills that can be taken up. And it's it may be unrealistic that it would be taken up this year, but we're going to introduce it this year and we're going to advocate for it. And if it doesn't pass this year, we can tr try again next year um, because Vermont has bienniums. It's two year cycles and this is the beginning of a cycle. So we have two years to try to get this through. So just to answer that question, I want to do that next. Um, so next we're going to call up one of my dearest friends. They're all asking which one right now. Um, no, but it's Beverly Little Thunder. So are you ready to go? I see you. <laughs> so I'm going to un ask to unmute you because we're, we have it set up like this. Okay. Take it away, Beverly. Oh, thank you, Brian. Um, well, you know, Native people have used a lot of these uh, plant medicines long before Europeans came here, long before the pharmaceutical companies decided to start extracting from some of these plant medicines to make their chemical medicines. And there are still people uh, who use these medicines for healing. We use them for people who have cancer. We use them for people who are suffering from debilitating illnesses that make it on, they cannot function. And, you know, a number of years ago, many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, I was a HIV AIDS uh, counselor in Southeastern Arizona. And, I had a lot of clients uh, who had a great deal of difficulty, a great deal of difficulty uh, eating with pain. And I had to go on the street and I had to try to find a source of buying street marijuana so that I could take it to these clients so it could ease their pain, ease their suffering, help them make that transition gently. I should not have had to do that. This is a plant medicine that was given to us by the creator to use. And a bill like this would enable people like myself to be able to grow those medicines and use them, not just for my family, but for relatives who might be suffering also. You know, it does create a regulatory venue when you start exchanging money. And let's face it, with the colonial system that has been set up, money is the great end all. People want these kinds of medicines so that they can get money for them. And believe me, there are people who are thinking in those terms. But for those of us that are working to help heal and help ease suffering within our communities, these plant medicines are invaluable. There is no price on them. And I support this bill because I know across the country, there are situations, even as we speak, we're having access to one of these plants would help ease someone's suffering. And none of us know what is gonna happen in the future in our own families, when our own families might benefit from these plant medicines. And so I support this bill and I urge everyone who hears this to support this bill. This is not about making money for a big co corporation. This is not about legalizing selling peyote on a street corner. This is not about the sale of any plant medicine. This is about the respect and the honor that the plants that have been given to us by creator be given. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Beverly. Um, thank you for highlighting the, the, the oldest use of plant medicine, which is all of our ancestors, wherever we come from on earth, we're indigenous people. All of our ancestors um, you know, were rooted 
our all of our cultures, all of our knowledge, everything is rooted in in nature and in and in our relationship to plants and fungi. And thank you for highlighting that for us um, and how we have this sort of sacred birthright and connection. Next, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Rick Barnett, and D Dr. Barnett is going to share. Um, his perspective, and he is rooted in our modern medical system. So um, Dr. Burnett, are you ready to go? I saw you out there. But... Oh, there you are. I'm asking to unmute you now, okay? There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thumbs up, good, all right. Thank you, Representative China and uh, Larry and Carlos from Decriminalized Nature. It's so good to hear from a previous speaker as well, from the Native people. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist in Stowe. I'm an addictions counselor. I'm also the chair for the Legislative Committee of the Vermont Psychological Association, although I want to be clear, I don't, do not represent the, uh, the Vermont Psychological Association on this call. I fully support this bill um, because I have seen firsthand from hundreds of people the benefits of these healing medicines. I'm also finishing up a year-long certificate program in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy and research through the California Institute on Integral Studies. So over the past year, I've done a deep dive into the research and the history and a lot of the um, different facets of the burgeoning psychedelic uh, world and this renaissance that they call it. Decriminalize uh, psychedelics, decriminalize plant medicine is an important component of it. And, and everyone that I speak to, um, I feel believes very strongly in the, the decriminalized movement. There is also this other force out there, as I mentioned earlier, around research. There's a tremendous amount of research being done right now on psilocybin mushrooms, uh, a pharmaceutical version of that, which is psilocin, and that's actually in the bill. I was happy to see that. Uh, with Ibogaine, uh, specifically for substance use disorder, even opioid use disorder, because of the unique pharmacological properties of that. And uh, I think that we really need all paths towards getting access to these medicines. I'm, I'm not somebody who aligns myself strictly with the medical model or the corporatization uh, medicalization model of psychedelics. Um, I think therapy and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is one route, but I also know firsthand there are people on this call and uh, people that we all know who hold space for others in a very ritualized and healthy way. And so having it decriminalized is really uh, beneficial to get access for people to get access to these medicines for whether it's for uh, anxiety or resi uh, treatment resistant depression for addictions, which is huge. In my opinion, we have this huge issue around addictions and psychedelics have a real potential to help a, a number of people. The, the options that we have now in psychiatry and psychology and addictions medicine, addiction treatment is okay, but um, we need all the tools. We need all hands on deck. And that's why I support this bill 100%. Um, it is, I think it's the right way to go. And, and I'm glad to hear from the decriminalized nature folks that this, this movement is really taking off. And I, a lot of gratitude for Representative China for taking a risk and sharing his story and, uh, and getting out in front of this. And hopefully we can, we can get some action on this uh, this year, if not next year, but I'm definitely gonna be uh, right there with uh, anybody who wants to reach out to your legislators and let's make this happen. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Barnett. So, um... While, while we're um, considering the perspective of medical providers, we're gonna hear from another medical provider next. We're gonna hear from Jesse Lynn Dolan, uh, who's a nurse here in Vermont. Jesse Lynn, are you ready? I'm gonna try to unmute you, all right. Hi, let me just get my video started. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Um, so I work with plant medicine all the time and have for decades, a lot longer actually than I've been a nurse and have seen, gosh, you know, a million different scenarios from the ER situations. I work a lot with opioid and multi-substance use disorder to working as an herbalist in the field as well. And really I'm coming, I'm just coming at the approach of Plant medicine is not only safer, we need to look at accessing more alternative routes than the typical, shall I say, allopathic route as to what we're looking at and the 
pandemic that we're in right now, maybe we need to start considering other options. And I also like to really work on the social justice aspect. I work um, in the cannabis field with a lot of different folks who have unfortunately been a victim to the drug war and prohibition. So I feel very strongly about supporting patient populations, meeting them where they're at, and then helping them to be able to access whatever they need without having those legal repercussions kind of looming over them. A joke in the cannabis nurse world is that the worst side effect is the legal repercussions that come along with plant medicine, right? So, so I, um, you know, I'm not extremely well versed specifically with entheogens or specific different medication. I come, like I said, from an herbalist background into the nursing world, specific working with addictions um, in pregnancy and infancy for the most part. And I've been working with cannabis medicine as a grower and a caregiver and a consultant for years at this point and really um, just want to be able to hear, you know, what you guys have to say, support Rep. Brian here in this agenda and move this forward. I agree. We'll see if the legislative committee is willing to take this up and where it will go this year. But I also very strongly agree that you have to do this every year. You have to be heard. You have to make yourself heard. And year after year, we will eventually get this. If plant medicine has taught me one thing, it's taught me patience. And I know that's not always easy, but whether it's growing or working with patients and healing yourself more naturally than that pharmaceutical, that's you know gonna kind of railroad you in 24 hours. We really need to be patient and work together. So I appreciate you know you guys all being here, using your voice, using your stories, and that's what we need. I'm a research nurse at the University of Vermont and I joke around, but the truth is what it has taught me over the last few years is I really want to hear the anecdotal information and believe a lot more of what my patients are talking about than going for those research studies that maybe only have eight people and we're kind of ruling everything by a study of eight. So, you know, I, um, again, don't have much more to offer. I'm always open to questions and conversations. I do love the fact that nurses are one of the most trusted professions out there. And with that, nurses need to be using their voices to advocate and, you know, kind of stick up for patients. And I'm not gonna pretend I'm an expert in every area and that's not what a nurse is and what we should do. We need to be there meeting patients where they're at, advocating for what their needs are. And I've heard from multiple patients and I'm continuing to hear from more patients as we see cannabis become more accepted, people are starting to talk more openly about other plant medicines that really are working for them. So I feel like we're just kind of starting to touch the surface of that anecdotal information being a little bit more available. People feeling more comfortable sharing their stories. And hopefully that's what we need other legislative advocates and representatives to hear and understand is those anecdotal patient stories that are so much more important sometimes than those pharmaceutical research studies that I'm working on in my day job, so. Thank you. Um, and so it was um, great to hear you mention how it's important um, as a healthcare provider to be looking out for what's best for patients. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I am also a healthcare provider. I'm a clinical social worker. Um, and uh, too often the voices of our patients get lost in the, you know, in the system. Um, and so speaking of the importance of, of the perspective of patients, when I first introduced this bill, I was surprised, well, not this bill, the last version of it, because there was H878 from last year, which is slightly different than this. When, we, when uh, I introduced H878, I had a lot of people contacting, um, contacting me from, um, from around the state and around the country who were patients, who were people who had experiences where they, they had healing from um, their relationship with plant and fungal medicines. And I heard from one young man, I say young because I'm also young, we're, I don't think we're that far apart in age, but one young man who told me his story and then um, trusted me enough to introduce me to his family and then started coming to the state house and talking to other legislators about his experience and educating them about how um, the medicines helped him and his family. And so I'd like to invite these brothers up now, Ryan and Rory, well, not up, but it's your chance to speak here on the screen. So we're gonna unmute you. And if you've spoken already, can you mute yourselves? Thank you. Hi, thank you, Brian. 
Yeah, can you turn that volume down a bit? It's echoing. Um, yeah, hi. I'm. My name is Rory Van Tyne, and I'm here with my brother Ryan. Hi. We are extremely passionate about this bill, and we want to thank you, uh, Brian, for putting this on as well as decriminalized nature. Um, I guess what I have to say is more of a, a testimony to the nature of these substances because um, I guess a little backstory on like uh, my story, I struggled with um, heroin, opiates, heroin for 10 years and methadone for seven years. And, um, you know, 10 years, seven years, it's a long time um, towards the end of that. 10 years, it got uh, pretty, you know, pretty brutal. And I didn't have any, I had a, the, the hope that I would get clean from these um, substances was getting more narrow and more narrow and to the point where I didn't really believe it was ever going to happen. And um, in November of 2019, um, I had an ayahuasca experience. And um, immediately overnight, I stopped using heroin. But at that point, I was still on a very high dose of methadone, um, like a high dose, like 120 milligrams, which is a significant dose. And so at that point, I was, uh, I had to decide, you know, I was trying to decide what to do. And um, luckily, you know, I had the experience of the ayahuasca. I also had, you know, supportive people, which is super helpful when it comes to psychedelics, um, in my opinion. But yeah, so the next three months I got from 120 milligrams down to zero milligrams and I've been off opiates ever since. And um, so it's more of just a testament to uh, how healing these substances can be. And I will, that's what I'm most passionate about at this point because I really don't think that there was anything else um, other than, you know, because my family had been there throughout it all. So I don't think there was anything else in, in this life that would have catalyzed me to realize how how beautiful and miraculous, uh, you know, life is other than the, this, uh, ayahuasca substance, which, uh, like, uh, Rick said in the comments is a, a DMT brew. Um, so that's all I really have to say. Um, I don't know, Ryan might want to say, speak yeah, on that. I was going to say that, um, I struggled with substance abuse too, in, in different ways and really bad depression through, um, my early twenties and I found psilocybin, I found studies and, um, ended up growing psilocybin and having an experience, which later I introduced, uh, you know, ayahuasca to Rory and these substances have changed our lives. And the one thing I would like is that, I mean, I wouldn't have to go through illegal back channels to have that experience. Um, I think that it's really, a a tragedy that people that are suffering don't have access to these things because me and Rory both tried to deal with our mental illness through every route that was legally um, allowed. Um, and illegally. And illegally too, you know, but, <laughs> but the pharmaceutical route, the, the medical model, it, it did what it could, but it, it didn't, it didn't help. Um, it didn't help get to the root of our problems. So finding a, you know, an alternative was, um, uh, yeah, a miracle, I guess. And, um, just one more thing, like, uh, my, my dad, my father's a medical doctor, psychiatrist. And so, uh, I, I wanted to, Brian and I talked, he, he, it would be nice if, I think he might want to say a couple things, if you guys are willing to listen to it, at least, um, you know, he grew up with a, a very much different background than, uh, he, you know, I don't think, I mean, I want him to speak on it. I don't, I don't think he was like very well educated on like plant medicines, you know, cause he's a medical doctor, but he's, I think seen a huge transformation. So I think he has testimony or, or something to say about it. So dad, if you want to, uh, or if Brian wants to unmute you, I, I think, I, I think we said just about everything. Okay. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm unmuted. Um, I'm Craig Van Tynan. It's my wife, Carol. As Rory said, I'm a psychiatrist. My wife's a uh, nurse practitioner in psychiatry. And um, I would just emphasize that the story Rory told in you know, a minute <laughs> is 10 years of really um, difficult, difficult period of time for us and included a, a lot of painful and very scary moments. And uh, it was, like, what can I say? It's, uh, heartrending and um, demoralizing when you have to deal with that for so long. 
Um, but I would say that the uh, ayahuasca experience that Rory had was pretty miraculous um, by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, it's really maintained its effect um, for a long time. My wife here is a very important part of that whole story. She's been huge. And, um, and, and I think we've learned a lot, both um, from the research, whether it's Roland Griffiths and Johns Hopkins or David Nutt Queens College, there's a lot of research that's uh, beginning to be very clear of how valuable it can be. And even knowing like uh, Bill uh, Wilson from the VA uh, or from the AA was treated at the VA with uh, LSD. And he really credited that with being very important with him getting off alcohol and really wanted to make it available to AA um, uh, groups throughout the country. Um, the more you read, the more impressive it is. And I would just say that I think not allowing people to have these um, plant medicines, I mean, basically it's back to politics against Nixon and uh, Eric and stuff. A lot of things are politics, but to know that we could potentially make these available for people to be able to utilize as people have used them for thousands of years throughout the world would be a, a very positive thing. And I really would be supportive of that and can talk about how valuable it is from a personal point of view, seeing what's happened um, with Rory and Ryan. And thank you for a chance to, to let you know our experience. Thank you. Um, and once again, I'd like to th thank your family for um, having the courage to to reach out to me and to trust me and um, it, you know it, it it wasn't immediate you know we started talking we got to know each other and then we're um, you know Rory and Ryan got the courage and started being more public and did you guys want to say anything about the um, the cultivating connections piece before we move on because I think that's important where this has led you okay I'm going to unmute you again and then we'll move on yeah yeah Dad, you got to turn your volume. <laughs> um, thank you, Brian, so much. Um, my brother and I just started doing this non -pro not for profit, a YouTube channel, just kind of documenting our story and, and what we've been through. And I think, you know, trying to promote uh, education and integration resources for people with psychedelics. And we found that the most important thing for us was connection. The psychedelics showed us that. And after our experiences, developing that connection and cultivating it was the thing that kept us going and kept us growing. So we started a nonprofit, it's Cultivating Connections. And um, our goal is really to increase avenues for people to connect, to share stories. Um, we do a weekly Zoom call also where people share their experiences and uh, everyone's welcome to join. Um, we'd love to see, I mean, we, we see some familiar faces yeah. already, but we'd love to see more of you guys. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, if uh, it, I'll just I'll just put it in the chat, you know, it's cultivating connections on YouTube is like uh, just us talking about, you know, our story and giving people perspective on like what it's like from our subjective experience, you know, and then cultivate and then there's also a website if you guys want to check out. And if you send us an email, uh, we can get we can send you the link to our zoom meet, our Thursday night zoom meeting. So yeah, and we'd love to talk more with anyone who's interested. Yeah, and thank you so much to Brian, and thank you so much to ev everyone that's here because uh, you know I'm super passionate about this, and this is the only thing that I, I one of the major things I want to you know ch work on. So thank you so much, and I'll put that Thanks in the again. Chat. Yes, thank you again. So um, next we're gonna have a friend of mine, Andy Kershaw, who's gonna share his experience um, with the healing of plant fungal medicine. Are you ready to go, Andy? I'm gonna look for you. All right. Yes. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. Let me share my story. Um, I've, I've been I've been very nervous to to share this story and, and trying to figure out why because um, I, I I I had such a such a such a profound uh, positive experience from plant medicine, specifically ayahuasca, but I was not comfortable sharing it with with certain people as I as I was with other close friends and and I, I realized that. Um, the criminalization of, of, of all this stuff um, 
has, has led to that. Um, it, it's a great place to start um, from a perspective of, of getting um, this type of plant medicine um, into the, into the, you know, sort of like larger vocabulary of, of mental health treatments for addictions and for depression. Um, decriminalization will have an immediate effect of, uh, of making it socially legal to even talk about with other people. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of people out there that just don't feel comfortable sharing their stories. Um, for me, I, I suffer from uh, uh, depression and anxiety from PTSD. Um, four years ago, my, uh, my, uh, my wife was, uh, was killed in a, in a, in a horrific fire. Um, I, I did see some people from Oakland and Berkeley in this chat, so you're probably very familiar with that event that happened. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, in, 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 it, 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 it's something that like is a long process of, of, of developing. Um, it's not like the PTSD and depression kicked in immediately, but um, a after about a year after that event, um, after the fire, I, uh, I, I just kept, it, it just kept getting worse and worse. And uh, I had doing, I had been doing uh, talk therapy um, uh, with a psychiatrist, uh, psychologist, and uh, like that, that was helping me process sort of the immediate stuff, but it, it got to the point where, um, you know, it just, it just, it just kept getting worse and worse. And uh, it had come up a, a few times about going on, you know, just regular like antidepressants, uh, prescription medication, stuff you take every day. And I, I, I was, you know, I've always been sort of resistant to that. Um, I don't want to discount that that can help a lot of people. Um, but it, it seems like that's just something that um, is from, from, I've talked to people that have been on it. And um, I, I used to work in that field. I used to be a pharmacy technician. So I, you know, have, have have read up on stuff like this and it, it just felt like that wasn't really what I wanted for healing. It was more of a, uh, something that, that helps you maintain. Um, but at the same time, I, uh, I did have a few friends reach out to me over the course of that, that period of time uh, about uh, ayahuasca ceremonies and they told me to look into that. And, you know, basically like I, I looked into it and it, it you know, it, it was, it was wild on, on seeing like, you know, people's experiences and, and, you know, how, powerful it could be, but also like, I, I looked at it like, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to go in the woods somewhere and like drink some plant thing and, and trip out. I was like, hell no, there's no way I'm doing this like right now. Like I was, I was, I, I thought like, you know, even though there's overwhelming uh, anecdotal and research evidence that it, it's, it's been used safely for millennium um, by, you know, by human beings, it's just, you know, I was, I wasn't at the point where I was like comfortable doing it. Um, but uh, it, years later, um, uh, which, which brings me to a, a year ago in, uh, in last February, um, I, I finally brought myself to be able to do it. Um, but you know, I had to go to Costa Rica to do it to find a, 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 a it, there was a week long retreat that um, uh, to, to me, what I was seeing, I, I felt comfortable doing it. And, you know, the, and, and uh, up until the very last moment, I, I, was, I was terrified. I, I almost didn't do it. But um, it, it really is, it, it was such a profound difference um, in, in, in the way I came home. Um, pe people described it as transformational. Um, I could definitely call it that, but also it was, um, it's not really transformational. I, I sort of transferred back to the way I was before. Um, and I, 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 I still have, um, you know, stuff to deal with um, as a, in the fallout, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, depressive episodes and whatnot, but um, it is really is miraculous. I, I now deal with that stuff as from a position of power rather than a place of um, d despair where like, I just feel like, like nothing was going to work. And I, I was afraid of just, you know, being on Prozac forever. And um, now I'm confident that that's something that, you know, is not going to happen, but it, it it's just, I couldn't even talk about it with people um, because it's been criminalized. And, and just the, the thought now, when I think of what it was like when we were, uh, th there was a group of like about 20, 25 people from all over the world who were there for different reasons. And, uh, you know, when we actually went around and, and were drinking the ayahuasca brew, um, it, the, the fact that I think that it, it, if, 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 as I was holding that, I was in possession of an illegal substance that could get me thrown in jail um, and get all of us thrown in jail. <laughs> Um, in most places in the world and where I'm from um, is, 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 is absolutely ridiculous. So um, while it's, it's long overdue and it's, a it's an idea that this time has come there where, you know, th this, this is definitely the future of mental health and 
and, and addiction cures and, and all that stuff. But uh, decriminalization is really the start, in my opinion, and I'm really happy that that's happening here. And um, I am going to urge my state rep uh, to do that. Um, so Brian Cena, if you are here uh, and listening, uh, I, I urge you to support your bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andy. I'll think about it. I'll take that into, con I'll take your concerns into consideration when I make my decision. And um, I do need to hear all the perspectives before, before I can commit to anything. Um, so thank you for joining us. So we do have a few minutes left and uh, some people have asked to speak. Um, so we're going to hear next from Julianne Barney for a few minutes. Um, if you're ready to go, I'm going to look for you in the Hollywood squares. I'm having issues, I'm having technical difficulties finding you, but there you are, all right. I'm asking to unmute you. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Julianne Barney, and um, I'm a retired paramedic. I'm a married mother of two teenagers in high school. I'm approaching the age of 50. And for the past 30 years, I have struggled with, um, as a result of severe developmental trauma, um, complex PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, a whole host of, of you know, squalae around, around childhood trauma. I have tried, I think, virtually every modality of psychotherapy, therapeutic interventions, including neurofeedback, um, the whole gamut of pharmaceutical uh, interventions and modalities. And this past summer, things were deteriorating to a, a severe point again, where I was not really sure I was going to make it through the winter. Um, I wasn't committed to living. I, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and it was, I was looking at either another private psychiatric hospitalization or golly gee, what about this plant medicine thing? Um, being raised in the age that I am, I was raised with the idea of say no to drugs and, and hallucinogenics in my mind at the time were definitely drugs. Um, a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of um, documentaries, a lot of discussion with my husband. And despite being a pandemic, we felt that the situation for myself was serious enough that it was worth the risk um, and the cost of, of almost $12,000 for me to travel to Costa Rica where it was legal. Um, and I participated in seven ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, I felt like I needed to do it with the supervision of um, folks who were trained in, um, in dealing with trauma, but also uh, trained and knowledgeable in the indigenous practices and the culture that's incorporated into these healing ceremonies. Um, in trying to sort of keep this brief, overall, the experience has been nothing short of miraculous. Um, I feel like the whole, for those science folks out there, you know, the whole, my default mode network in my brain has had a complete reset. And um, I am able to perceive you know, perspective taking, um, self empathy, empathy of others, um, able to process trauma, uh, work with memories in a way I've never been able to do for 30 years. Um, so this issue is actually very important to me because it was through experiencing this that I, I believe that this shouldn't be an illegal process. And, and a lot of people, most people are not as fortunate as I am and able to travel to a country where it's legal. And, and so I feel like there's an injustice by having these plant medicines um, under the criminal Ill, being Ill, illegal um, in our country. Um, and, and in our state, um, because I, I don't, I don't want to knock all the other treatment modalities. I think they're important um, and and can be very helpful. But for me, it was it was the psychedelic experiences that enabled me to then tie all that other learning that I have accumulated over the years together. And I I, I firmly believe my life has been transformed, and I am so incredibly grateful. And, and I, I want others to be able to have that opportunity if they so choose to, to pursue that for themselves as well. 
So thank you for listening. And this is the first time I've shared this publicly. And, and, and I, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm really now I'm confident that this, this has worked. I'm three months, three months out and, and just feeling so full of gratitude and full desire to live a very full, long, happy life and, and be a contributing member of society where I can, I can help others. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you for stepping up to share um, and, uh, and for pointing out how, you know, for sharing publicly, like you said, for the, um, for the first time. And, you know, when the, the criminalization of these medicines, it, it, it's yet another symptom of, of the greater disease that's happened to humanity um, and the trauma that humans have caused to each other and to the earth. Um, and the first step in healing trauma is to talk about it. The first step is to acknowledge it and to talk about it, put it out there. Then we, once we acknowledge that trauma, we can put that trauma in its place and make meaning from it and move on. And so thank you for being courageous and talking and sharing with us. Um, we have one more person who's gonna um, share his story and then I'm gonna wrap things up and just kind of um, sort of make my ask again about what we're doing, like just where we're doing next. So before we do that, we're gonna hear from one more speaker, um, David. I'm looking for you, David Arndt, I believe. Yes, David Arndt. And I'm gonna look for you and unmute you. And if, if you've already spoken, if you can mute yourself just to reduce any feedback. I don't hear any, but just being mindful of that. So here we go. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. We can oh. hear you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say how grateful I am to you, you know, for your courage, you know, to do this and to gather everyone together. You know, I have, I have great respect for that. Um, I'd just like to speak for some who, who can't be here tonight. Um, I was in Palenque, Mexico in 1993 uh, with Terrence McKenna, who I already knew. He can't be here because he's no longer alive. Uh, Jonathan Ott, who coined the term entheogen. Um, Paul Stamets, who was really responsible for psilocybin, you know, spreading in the, in the U.S. and becoming, you know, making it possible for it to become um, legalized. Eduardo Luna, who was, a, he's the world's like leading, uh, knows the most about ayahuasca. Uh, like he lived with like two different tribes. Um, and I know how grateful they would be you know, for what you are doing and, and for everyone gathered here, because really back then, this was our intention. And um, for a good nine years, Terrence um, traveled everywhere like the Pied Piper, uh, spreading the word, you know, um, but we never, we didn't dream it would happen this quick. Um, but if, if I could just add myself personally, um, just um, from a perspective of the bill, which I know we all want to succeed, um and brian who you know in the house she's been there 28 years chair of human services i've studied policy with her as well as lacy sloan who's been responsible for countless bills um the bill for the bill to be successful I, there's different parts of it right now that i think will not make it successful i don't even think she'd put the language chemical I think it should just be the plants. Uh, I think it should, you know, it, the First Amendment, okay, freedom of religion. Okay, the native people are already, there's legal precedent for, um, for peyote. Uh, St. Saint, Saint Adami Church, also already a legal precedent for ayahuasca with them. So like, this is not impossible, but as soon as you add the word chemical, Okay, that means extraction, all right? And, and that's really not, that, um, that language will, um, it'll be, it won't pass. I mean, I really hate to say this, and I, you know, I could be wrong, but, um, and also Datura, uh, there's some, I don't know if you've experienced Datura, but there's some things in here which, uh, well, actually, Datura, no one should really experience that unless they truly know what they're doing. I mean, it's quite dangerous, actually. And Ibogaine, 
um, you, the, the context that, re, that you need to be in is, you know, it's something you gotta be careful with. I don't know whether you should add in the bill or not. Psilocybin, well, psilocybin, of course, but just in the mushroom form, not as a chemical, okay? And then ayahuasca, because, and don't say DMT, dimethyltryptamine, just say ayahuasca, because that is contained within it. Um, and so from a policy perspective, and I'm happy to talk to you later, if this bill is rewritten in a way that doesn't include chemicals, drugs, extraction, that just focuses on the these sacred nature, these plants, you know, with a sort of legal, you know, um, I mean, one of the rulings was a Supreme Court ruling. So like you said, you know, I bet the first time it doesn't pass, but I bet you the second time it does pass. So I just know that Terrence, he's no, he's no longer alive. Jonathan Ott's house was burned down. He's gone totally off, off the grid. Paul Stamets, I don't know, can't reach him. But, you know, I really want to help and see what everybody wants to, to see happen. But I just think, you know, the bill could be written in a way, I mean, I humbly say this, you know, I understand if you disagree, but that it could be written in a way where there would be, there would not be, there would be less legal challenges and there would be a, a greater chance of success. Because to be honest with you, the way it's written right now, um, I mean, myself personally, like um, it would be hard for me because it's just the way it's written, I, I know it wouldn't pass. And it's, it, it's, it could be written in a way that that's, it could be a setback actually, um, the way it's written. And that's no criticism. I mean, and again, this is my perspective, um, but you know, so maybe it's something to talk about later, but first, first amendment, two legal precedents, only, only have it be about the plant, no mention of chemicals, no mention of extraction. And then also some other pieces built in like from the decriminalization of marijuana. Okay, you combine those together, you know, then you have like a solid bill. You know, then you have something that you can even say legally, you know, there's a, there is a, there's precedent. I think that's important. I think Anne, you know, who's been in the house 28 years, you know, um, I think she would, I think she would come on board. Um, I think Dennis McKenna, he could possibly come to Vermont. So I, I'll stop now because I don't want to take all this time, but, but so much gratitude. And I hope you'll, you know, be willing to talk about the bill because um, really I've seen that bills that are successful and some bills that are not. And this one could be written in a way to get what you want and everyone wants that would have a better chance of success. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so that's, you know, on that point, um, you know, there one of the one of the strengths of the legislative process is that it's a process. It's a long, arduous process. And we are only at the beginning here. So this bill's been drafted and we're collecting co-sponsors. At this time, I'm not trying to change the language of the bill before introduction because the deadline is Tuesday. So it has to get handed in. So what we're trying to do is gain some co-sponsors. Um, and David pointed out that there's, he named some people that he knows in the legislature, you know, getting more of those people on board around the issue, even if the approach isn't perfect. And then when the bill is introduced, it will get sent to a committee. Then what we will do is try to get the committee to take the bill up for testimony. At that time, there's plenty of opportunity for people to suggest changes to the language. So the committee hopefully will hear from people who both support and oppose the bill. And hopefully they'll hear all the different perspectives of how the bill could be written. And then the committee has the opportunity to take the time to change the language of the bill. So at, at this point, if people have suggested changes, I would um, ask that you, you know, send them to the committee after we introduce the bill. And hopefully um, they'll take it off the wall and work on it because there isn't time for us to change the language before we introduce it because it's gotta go in in a few days. So. Um, what we're going to ask next is that people reach out to your Vermont state representatives and Vermont senators. And um, 
there is a way to do that that um, I can post in the chat. One way is going to be going to this website. You know what? Actually, I can show you how to, maybe I'll show people how to do this quickly. It'll only take a minute if that's okay. Um, so once again, I want to make sure I show you the right thing. All right. So here is the, the legislative website. And if you go on here, you've got bill resolution legislator committee. So legislator, if you type in your town, like, let's see, I live in Burlington. What happens? It brings up all of the Burlington legislators. Now you may not know your exact district in Burlington. If you wanted to, you could do some more internet research to determine that. But you could also send a message to all the senators and representatives from Burlington and say, you live in Burlington. I don't personally don't mind when people do that to me. Um, let's say you live in Cabot. I saw some friends from Cabot in there. You type in, now I know you know your representatives, the people I saw from Cabot. In fact, some of you ran for representative, but if you type in Cabot and you hit enter, you see that there's two senators, three senators for the Washington district, and then you only have one representative. So you can email that one representative, ask them to be a co-sponsor, but you could also email all four and say, please support this effort. Um, maybe one of the senators would introduce companion legislation um, that's similar to this. So that's how you find your legislator if you um, if you live in Vermont. So I'm going to um, go back to the main page here. Ah, I clicked the wrong button and something weird happened, but I don't know if it affected you. Um, and I'm going to post it in the chat. So here you go. That's the Vermont legislative website. And um, our friends from Decriminalized Nature created some cool slides. Um, so if, if um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat too. If you are not already in touch with me and you wanna get on our list, you can send me an email here and I'll add you to the list. Um, and you can even write to me and say, can you please send me those slides? I haven't gotten them yet and I'll send them to you by tomorrow morning or like probably, I'm probably gonna honestly cut myself off of the technology as soon as this is done and walk in the snow. But like tomorrow morning, I also have to put the chickens to bed, um, but tomorrow morning, um, I will send you the slides. Um, I see somebody else posted another resource. Thank you. Um, but yeah, the ask would be to reach out to your representatives, the senators, and um, especially the representatives, ask them to co-sponsor the bill. If you email uh, me and get on our list, once the bill is introduced, this, the next ask will be to email the committee members and the committee chair that it goes to um, and say to them, please, um, take this bill up for testimony and then they can um, work on it. And then people could give their feedback um, about, you know, what, whether or not they like the way it's written, what could be better about it, you know, et cetera. So, um, so I'm just thinking uh, people are writing in the chat. It's kind of distracting me because I'm trying to wrap this up. So um, I'm going to ignore you not to be rude um, and try to wrap this up so everyone can go chill. Um, so, once again, the next step is getting co-sponsors. And then the, the step after that is um, to ask the committee, take it up. And here's something I will else I'll show you is um, if you go to the legislative website, you can actually see the different committees here. So I'm clicking on committees and you can see all the House and Senate committees. Um, I'm not sure where this is gonna go. It may go to human services or judiciary. Usually decriminalization stuff goes to judiciary. If you click on judiciary, you can see here all the committee members and you can click on them to get their emails. Um, so once it goes to committee, we would that's what we're gonna do next is email the committee members and the chair and ask them to take it up for consideration. And then you can also send them emails with testimony saying like, here's why you should take it up. Um, so I think I, I'm good at that point with the ask um, of what we want you to do next. And, should, they, um, um, should, should they wait until it's introduced to send the emails or send the emails now? And then how should they title the, um, how should they reference the bill? So between now, what is it? I don't even know what time it is anymore, day. I'm living in like this Zoom vortex. Um, it's Tuesday night at 8.14, all right. So by Thursday morning, so if, if people want to take action, you'll email your legislator either tonight or tomorrow morning, and you'll say, please co-sponsor this bill. It doesn't have a number yet. Um, 
I'm just thinking that if you email me, I can send you a copy of the bill. So you can send them a copy of it. Say, look, here's a bill, you know, that I want you to co-sponsor. Or you could just say, could we please contact Representative China and ask him to send you his plant medicine, plant fungal medicine bill. Um, but that being said, we're asking for co-sponsorship by Thursday, by, I could even say by Thursday at 5 p.m. because Friday I'm going to hand it in. Um, and um, that would be the next step. So there's no bill number yet. It, um, once the bill gets handed in, it will be given a number and it will go to a committee and then that's when we would refer to it by number. I can show you what a bill looks like when it goes to a committee just to see, see, see how the website works. Um, So this is the Judiciary Committee again. If you click here, bills in and out of committee, it shows you all of the bills that, that, that are in that committee. So you can see everything in this committee from sale and use of fireworks to firearms regulations to, oh God, not this one, immunization, immunizations. Um, talk about controversy right now. Um, judiciary gets a lot of the controversial bills. Oh, look at this one an act relating to strict liability for damages caused by domestic dogs. So this is probably the committee where our bill will go alongside you know, an act relating to switchblade knives. Um, I don't see any of the other decrim stuff in here yet, but this is usually where the decrim stuff goes. So um, I'm making light of it because it's late and people need to laugh uh, and I'm projecting, I'm engaging in psychological projection there too. So. We could combine the bills. We could have, you know, switchblade dogs, uh, switchblades with domestic dogs and plant medicine and one thing. So that being said, um, I do appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Um, I'm just going to look at my friends from Decriminalized Nature. Do you think we covered everything we needed to? We made the ask. And I, I think the main thing is if you're confused and you're like, I need more help, email me. I have like, I'm like 100 me emails behind, but in the morning I will make time to write plant medicine in the subject or, or plant fungal medicine. And so I'll look for those and try to just get back to you um, with what you need to take action in time for us to meet these deadlines. Um, and I know um, from the chat that not everyone agrees with this approach and I respect that. Um, and there are other approaches. Tomorrow there's going to be a press conference. I don't know if Brenda's still here, but if Brenda wants to post info in the chat, there's going to be a press conference tomorrow about various decriminalization efforts. Um, so there's more than one approach we're trying to take here in our effort to decriminalize. So um, are you trying to say something now? I saw your camera going. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, I'll let you, but which I think people are also trying to leave. Um, so um, I know everyone's putting their cameras on. So focus. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to end now. We've gone a little over time. Thanks everyone who stuck around with us. Thank you for your interest. Thanks. I just really want to thank the people who spoke um, from their heart with their personal experiences, because ultimately that's what this is about. It's about the healing of us as individuals, the healing of us as, as, as humans, as the human nation, and the healing of all of our relations and our planet. Um, that's what this is really about. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and we'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate this. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.